Uh, we're very happy to have Max Abrams from Northeastern University, who is research, uh, is on, most of you from political science, you already know, is on terrorism, and he's published very widely in terrorism. His, uh, his PhD work was uh, specifically, specifically related to Israel, and um, from the, we're, I'm very happy to welcome him from the Center for the Economics of uh, Peace and Security. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just begin by thanking my hosts. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm having a very good time. And uh, so without further ado, uh, so the, the title of this talk is uh, Predicting Terrorism, uh, Which Groups Attack Civilians, When and Why? The story begins actually not too far from here, uh, a little over a decade ago. Um, when I headed to the West Bank uh, to do some field research. I was living in uh, Jerusalem, and by day I would take uh, cabs and other means of transportation uh, into the West Bank. And, and as you know, when you think about it, this was a, a very interesting time in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is that this was during the the so-called Second Antifada, uh, when Palestinian terrorism uh, was on the rise. Um, and secondly, Israel was in the process of building up a massive security wall uh, to effectively separate the Palestinian-dominated West Bank um, from the rest of Israel. And so I went on this trip um, hoping to get a better understanding of the conflict, to see the wall firsthand, to speak to Israelis, to speak to Palestinians. Let's do the fence. Fence, sure, we could go with fence. Go yeah, with fence, because when you use wall, yes. you're being ideological, I don't want to, we don't want to be ideological here. Sure. Okay, so it's 97% fence. Fence is fine. Okay, so you can go with fence. Fence it is. 3% wall. So Almost all fence. Or use separation <laughs> barrier, and it'll be quite neutral. Sure. Fence. Fence it is. Um, so I went to, to go see the, um, the fence and to understand the conflict uh, up close. So the, the Israelis that I spoke to, they explained to me that they weren't really proud of this fence, but that they felt like um, they needed to have it. Uh, because over throughout the 1990s, uh, with all the, the attacks against civilians and in buses, in restaurants, etc., that there was a, a loss of confidence uh, that the Palestinians could be, uh, you know, viable partners for peace, um, and so that Israel was basically taking its security into its own hand, hands and physically erecting some sort of a barrier to prevent suicide bombers from from crossing from the West Bank. The Palestinians I spoke to, of course, had a, had a very different perspective. And they explained to me how the wall was really bad for them in, in, in all sorts of ways. It, it was embarrassing, it, it was uh, harmful to the economy, and there was a sense that it might um, have a negative uh, political impact uh, in terms of the future contours of, uh, of, of a Palestinian state. So one day, from the back of a cab, um, I started reading um, uh, an article by Robert Pape uh, called The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism. The article had just come out and it had not yet become the single most cited study ever written on the subject of terrorism. And one of the reasons why Pape's paper is so famous is because it's both simple and yet very, very ambitious. He purports to explain suicide terrorism. Why do groups use this tactic? And what he says is that suicide terrorism, and terrorism more generally, frankly, it, 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 it may be immoral, but it's actually rational political behavior. It's strategic. Uh, lower level members of the group, they might not be you know, rational actors so much, but the leadership is rational, and political, and they select the tactic of suicide terrorism because it offers the groups the very best chance of coercing governments, of pressuring governments 
and to making major political concessions. Yeah, I mean, the logic of it is, um, is very, very compelling. The basic idea is that somebody is going to blow himself up, harm a lot of civilians, and governments, while they may say, you know, we don't negotiate with terrorists, are then put under pressure to become more politically conciliatory um, and to trade, you know, some sort of concessions uh, to the perpetrators. As proof, Pape didn't offer a whole lot of evidence uh, for this thesis. Um, it's largely reliant on the case of the Palestinians, who he describes as the paradigmatic example that terrorism pays, that suicide terrorism is an effective instrument of coercion. But, of course, the, the disconnect was, was very, very clear to me. You know, here I am reading this study on the political efficacy of suicide tactics. Um, meanwhile, Israel is in the process of building up this fence. The Palestinians I spoke to were not happy. They sure didn't view themselves as, you know, political success stories. And, uh, and indeed, the, the terrorism was largely responsible for the fence in the first place, uh, having eroded Israeli confidence um, in, uh, in, in trading land for peace uh, with the Palestinians. And so I started thinking to myself, well, <laughs> this is very interesting. If the Palestinians are the political success story, then how have other groups fared politically um, that also use terrorism? In looking around at the research landscape, I quickly determined that Pape's argument, although original, um, is actually quite representative of the field. Um, I, I call this perspective the strategic model for terrorism. And as the name suggests, again, the basic idea is that given the constraints of these groups, suicide terrorism, or terrorism more generally, is the optimal tactic for inducing governments into making political concessions. Now, when you think about it, the strategic model is predicated on the assumption that generally terrorism works in some capacity, um, that it's an effective tactic, that the outcome of terrorism politically um, accords with this notion that that's why groups are doing it. Groups are doing it because governments are more induced to comply politically. But when I surveyed the, the research landscape, I did this in, in graduate school, when I looked around for studies on the political outcome of terrorism, I didn't actually find a, a whole lot of uh, empirical evidence. In fact, for whatever reason, scholars seem to have avoided looking at, at least systematically, how governments respond in the face of terrorism. And so, as a PhD student at UCLA, uh, this was really my main focus. Uh, a, a bunch of empirical studies on the political outcome of terrorism, especially in comparison to, to other tactical choices available to the group. Um, now, I just want to be clear here. When we talk about the efficacy of terrorism, the effectiveness of terrorism, you might conceive of that in all sorts of different ways. How many people are killed, how much media attention there is, how much fear it instills. But the strategic model represented by Pape is very clear that success should be measured in terms of, of, of the political outcome, in terms of whether the groups, the perpetrators, uh, manage to achieve their stated political aims. Um, and I think that that makes a lot of sense because otherwise you could easily imagine a scenario where terrorism has a 100% success rate. You know, you might say, well, look, that incident was so violent and it, it attracts so, many at so much attention and instills so much fear, if that's your coding scheme, then, then terrorism, by its very definition, um, is a winning strategy. So I began looking at this question of the outcome of terrorism and, and, and became sort of more methodologically rigorous over time as I explored this question um, in grad school. So by, I began, for example, with a case study on the Palestinians, uh, I then did a, uh, a case study on uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, which really um, was helpful in terms of my understanding of the effects of terrorism. 
Uh, just to give you a sense of how I might go about coding these sorts of things, uh, Osama bin Laden said that he attacked the United States uh, to achieve four main political goals, uh, to sever US relations with uh, apostate regimes, by which he meant basically pro-Western uh, Muslim governments like in Egypt and in Pakistan, uh, to sever US relations uh, with Israel, to uh, expel the United States from the Persian Gulf, um, and to stop the, the, the killing, uh, the, uh, the, to stop crusader wars, the killing of, of Muslims around the world. Now, how did the United States respond to 9-11? Of course, we did the political opposite. We, we didn't sever relations with these so-called apostate regimes. We actually strengthened them. They were seen as assets in the context of the war on terrorism. Uh, the U.S. did not sever relations with Israel. This was, in fact, maybe the heyday of the U.S.-Israeli relationship in terms of Bush and Sharon. Uh, the U.S. certainly did not withdraw from the Persian Gulf. We increased our troop presence uh, by a factor of 15, uh, led by the Iraq War. And we certainly didn't reduce our killing of Muslims around the world. We killed many Muslims in the context of the war on terrorism. Now, a lot of people talk about Islamic State and how sort of un uniquely successful this group is in, in all sorts of ways. But I would argue that Islamic State, at least in a territorial sense, has been successful using a different causal mechanism, if you will. It's not that its, that its attacks have persuaded governments into, into making concessions to the group, but rather Islamic State has really relied very heavily on power vacuums in areas just that are very loosely governed. Um, I would argue that's the main way that Islamic State has, has been able to seize territory, not just in, in Iraq and Syria, uh, but with its affiliates elsewhere. It's basically been able to attract uh, defectors from, from rival groups and to set up shop and to grow in power um, in these areas rather than by sort of negotiating uh, with target countries. Indeed, when you look at how governments have responded to Islamic State upon being attacked, um, I think that it further undermines uh, the strategic model. And in all the cases, every single target country has not become more politically conciliatory, hasn't moved to the left, but rather has become even more politically intransigent and in favor of a military solution against Islamic State. So take, uh, take the United States, for example. The US wasn't particularly interested in taking on Islamic State uh, until our, our journalist, James Foley, was beheaded. It was only then that Obama made a big speech and said, you know, we're going to take Islamic State very seriously. We're going to extend the anti-ISIS coalition uh, into Syria as well. Um, in France, you know, obviously there was a big attack, the, uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo attack. How did the French respond? They weren't intimidated. They didn't, also, they did not become more conciliatory towards the terrorists. Quite the opposite. They became really defiant. You know, even when it was reported that one of the terrorists was still on the loose, um, they had this march that attracted unprecedented numbers, unseen since the end of World War II. Uh, people didn't stop buying Charlie Hebdo magazine. Uh, sales increased by orders of magnitude. Uh, the electorate moved, uh, not to the left, but to the political right. Uh, the Front National uh, picked up a, a lot of support. And polls showed that the French public became more, not pro-ISIS, but pro-Assad. Um, and, and perhaps most tellingly, the French got really involved in the military campaign against Islamic State, um, perhaps reflected best in moving their aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, uh, to the Persian Gulf in order to, to bomb the heck out of Islamic State. Canada, too, has also experienced a couple sort of ISIS-related terrorist attacks. Um, that has um, increased the powers of the, of the spy agency at home, uh, moved the electorate to the right, um, and now the Canadians are more hawkishly anti-ISIS um, than, than its southern neighbor. Um, which is interesting. Uh, Jordan was a, was a real question mark. Uh, 
Um, I wasn't sure when they torched its citizen how the Jordanian public would respond. A lot of Jordanians didn't view the conflict with ISIS as directly relevant to them. They thought it might be, you know, sort of like a, a Western construct. Um, but after the, the torching of, of, of that citizen, uh, the Jordanian public got behind the government and they too took a much more proactive role in, in taking on Islamic State. Uh, we saw something similar with Egypt. Uh, Egypt is not a formal member of the anti-ISIS uh, coalition, but after ISIS uh, beheaded uh, 21 Egyptian Coptics in Libya, um, all of a sudden Egypt got very serious about uh, taking on ISIS and um, has offered to play a leading, a leading role in creating some kind of a pan-Arab military force against uh, the group. Uh, Japan is, is also an interesting story because according to Article 9 of their constitution created in 1947 after World War II, uh, they're banned from having uh, war-making abilities. But after ISIS killed two of its citizens, uh, there became a movement in Japan to overturn Article 9 uh, to, in order to respond to threats like, uh, like Islamic State. And so I just list these as some, some anecdotal examples, some illustrative salient cases um, to show you that at least on the surface, there are some very real reasons to doubt um, the underlying premise of the strategic model, which is that terrorism is effective at softening governments up into uh, basically making, uh, appeasing the perpetrators. Of course, there are real limitations of case studies in, in, uh, in any field, I would say. Um, but I would say that it, it's, it's particularly important uh, in terrorism studies I, I, I'm, I'm partial to large-end studies um, because, for, for one reason, in the case of terrorism, there have been so many different attacks going back so many different years, so many different groups, so many different re regions, etc., that if you're looking for empirical support and you're reliant on a case study, you can almost always find it. You can, you can fall victim of, of all sorts of storytelling by trying to find you know, one sort of confirming uh, you know, example from, from a case study. And, um, and, and in fact, there are some very well-known um, theories within uh, terrorism studies that I believe have fallen victim of this methodological problem that do in fact seem to hold in those cases, but if the researchers um, had looked at the generalizability, um, they wouldn't have been able to proceed with the argument. So at UCLA as a grad student, I began conducting uh, the first uh, large-end studies as well on the political efficacy of terrorism. And the first paper I did along those lines is called Why Terrorism Does Not Work, uh, which I published in 2006. And what I did was I looked at the uh, a group of foreign terrorist organizations, FTOs, and I separated them by their target selection. I divided them up, I disaggregated them into uh, groups that mainly focus on civilian targets versus groups that mainly focus on military targets. Um, and I thought to do this for a number of reasons. The first is that although there's no consensus over the definition of terrorism, most people, it seems to me, think of terrorism as against civilian targets, right? Now, that's debatable, um, but uh, it does, very often scholars will emphasize attacks against civilian targets um, as sort of the quintessential example of a terrorist attack. Furthermore, when I looked at, I did a content analysis of uh, Osama bin Laden's, um, basically his explanation of history by looking at uh, the universe of translated um, statements by him, according to the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. And what I found is that all of the successful examples of asymmetric campaigns, according to him, were not examples where the group attacked civilian targets, but rather when they attacked military targets. In fact, Three examples in particular comprise the vast majority of bin Laden's examples given for successful asymmetric campaigns. Uh, when uh, Hezbollah attacked um, 
uh, international peacekeepers in Lebanon in the, in the 1980s, uh, inducing them to withdraw. Uh, when the Mujahideen attacked the Red Army in Afghanistan. Um, and when militants, uh, you know, the Black Hawk Down, uh, when militants attacked an American uh, helicopter, uh, I think it was in like 1993, uh, in Somalia. All of these cases were violence directed against uh, military targets, not civilian ones. And so I thought to disaggregate the groups along those lines. And what I found is that groups that uh, primarily attack civilian targets are much less likely, at least based on that sample, to achieve their stated political goals than groups that direct their violence against military targets. And I concluded that terrorism is therefore um, actually a losing political tactic, again, if we define sort of the dependent variable as government concessions and our understanding of terrorism is essentially a civilian-centric uh, tactic. Now, since then, a number of people have looked at this question of the political effectiveness of terrorism, specifically whether groups that use terrorism manage to achieve their stated goals. And there does seem to be a consensus that actually terrorism is very, very, very highly correlated with political failure, right? So uh, there are uh, other studies by the Rand Corporation. Jones and Lebecki published a, a well-known uh, report in 2008. Audrey Cronin published a book in 2009. They use different samples, and they all find that actually the likelihood of terrorists achieving their, strategic, their stated strategic goals uh, is very, very low. However, where the pushback happened is not over whether terrorism is correlated with political failure, but whether it causes it, right? Whether terrorism is actually responsible for lowering the rate of government concessions. And there are all sorts of reasons to be suspicious in thinking that maybe terrorism is not driving the political failure. For instance, it's often said that terrorism is a weapon of the weak, you know? And if that's true, that groups gravitate to the tactic of terrorism when weak, maybe it's their lower capability which is why the groups aren't achieving their stated political goals. It's also very commonly believed that groups that use extreme tactics, like terrorism, equally harbor extreme political preferences. And so if terrorists disproportionately have very extreme preferences, then that might be another explanation for why governments are more reluctant to comply politically. And so, over time in grad school, I look not just at correlation, I use you know, like just a simple logit model uh, where I try to control for all sorts of potential tactical confounds that could be um, driving the results in terms of whether governments make concessions or not. Uh, so for example, I control for the capability of the group. Um, this is something political scientists who work with political violence are always trying to do. It's not entirely clear how to proxy militant group capability, um, but I control for all sorts of things that are plausible, like uh, the membership size of the group, how long the group has been around for, whether it has external supporters, whether the group uses suicide tactics, which Robert Pape famously says adds a coercive punch. Uh, I looked at the strength of the target country in all sorts of ways. It's regime type, for example. It's sometimes said that, democ that liberalism is a liability for counterterrorism. Um, I looked at GDP, material capabilities, population, etc. I also control for the nature of the, of the political demand. And what I find is that, at least based on this study, uh, terrorism is not just correlated with political failure, it actually causes it. Specifically, it reduces the chances of government concessions when you limit the definition of terrorism to attacks against civilian targets uh, versus military ones. Uh, put another way, the opposite way, 
attacks at selective violence against military targets is more politically successful than indiscriminate violence against civilian targets, even after I tried to take into account all sorts of other uh, potential confounds. Um, I've also done this in the context of, uh, of hostages, hostage crises. When uh, terrorist groups seize hostages, when they kill civilians versus military. And again, I find that all else equal in hostage crises, in particular, when a civilian has been killed, the government is less likely to make concessions than when a, uh, a, a member of the military has been killed. Now, you know, it's very common for people to say, that's nice, sounds like you really tried your hardest to isolate the independent tactical effects. But ultimately, there seems to be an inherent endogeneity problem. I'm really not sure you can, you can do it. And so I actually conducted a, uh, a controlled experiment to, to try to you know, quell this kind of uh, criticism. Um, and it's a, uh, a survey uh, embedded in an experiment, on a, or an experiment embedded in a survey, you never know which one, on a uh, large representative sample of Americans. And basically what I did was I presented them with a series of uh, identical vignettes uh, where a group um, said that it was annoyed um, and that it wants the government to make concessions. The one thing that I manipulate, which makes the, the, between the treatment and the control, is I manipulate the stated tactical choice of the perpetrators. And what I find is that when respondents think that the perpetrators use terrorism. I don't call it terrorism. I, I, I describe it as the group attacking civilian targets. Um, in another one, they attack only military targets. In another one, they attack no targets. What I find is that when civilian targets are attacked, i.e. terrorism, respondents are uh, much less confident that the perpetrators um, are viable partners for negotiation. And I basically um, uh, uh, propose um, a new heuristic in international relations to account for um, my results. And I call it uh, the correspondence of means and ends bias. And the bias is that people tend to infer the extremeness of international actors' political preferences based on the extremeness of the tactics that they use. We tend to infer the extremeness of the ends of the group, its desired ends, from the extremeness of the means that the perpetrators use. And for that reason, terrorist groups very frequently have a credibility problem because people don't believe them. Because even if they say that their goals are actually very moderate. By dint of their using extreme tactics, people tend to conclude that they must secretly harbor extreme ends, extreme political preferences. And that's one of a couple reasons why I think civilian targeting, all else equal, tends to be politically suboptimal, if you will, in terms of inducing government compliance. So, Basically, moving along, I no longer focus on the political outcome of terrorism. I don't do case studies on this. I don't do large end studies on this. I don't do controlled experiments on this. But the takeaway that I want to leave you is that my research conducted, at least throughout grad school, suggests that actually the strategic model is predicated on a weak empirical basis that terrorism defined as non-state actors attacking civilian targets really seems to be more of a political liability in terms of inducing government concessions. And so that raises what I call the puzzle of terrorism. And the puzzle, of course, is then why do groups attack civilian targets if it doesn't actually seem to pay politically? Now, you might say to yourself, Okay, well, maybe the reason why terrorists seem to use this suboptimal tactic is because they're irrational. Or maybe it's because they're apolitical. But the problem with that sort of objection 
is that it's widely believed that, at least at the level of the leadership, that the leadership we're dealing with is essentially uh, rational political actors, even if lower level members uh, may be less political and frankly, uh, less rational, arguably. So this got me thinking, maybe the strategic model had things backwards. Maybe it's not that the leadership instructs the group to attack civilian targets because that offers the best chance of achieving the group's stated political goals, maybe it's the exact opposite. Maybe the leaders understand that civilian targeting is actually a political liability and that we would see more civilian targeting in groups led by weaker leaders where lower level members of the organization have greater tactical autonomy. So my theory is that far from being a politically effective tactic, civilian targeting, which is selected by the leadership to achieve the group's political goals, groups actually gravitate to terrorism when they're suffering from leadership deficits in which lower level members of the organization have disproportionate clout in terms of uh, the tactical choices of the organization. I believe that leadership deficits promote terrorism because the incentives of members to perpetrate indiscriminate violence against the population are inversely related to their position within the organizational hierarchy. That is to say, organizations with weak leadership control are more inclined to terrorism because tactical decisions are delegated to lower level members of the group who tend to have stronger incentives than the leadership to attack civilian targets. I'm basically using a, a principal agent uh, framework an organizational explanation to account for variation in, in uh, whether militant groups attack civilians or not. Now, for several reasons, I think a, a member's position within the organizational hierarchy is inversely related to its incentives for harming civilians. The first is that the leadership of militant groups tends to be the oldest whereas the, the, the lowest level members of the group tend to be the youngest. Um, and so all else equal, if it's true that civilian targeting actually carries political costs, it would most likely be the leadership that understands the potential political perils of civilian targeting, whereas low level members new to asymmetric conflict would likely be less likely to have arrived at this conclusion. Secondly, the leadership tends to have more organizational resources at its disposal, whereas lower level members of the group, they're further away from the purse of the organization. That's true of, of probably all organizations. Um, and so if a, if, a, if a higher level person in the group wants to commit an attack, in a sense, they have the luxury of, of superior finances, and they could probably help to execute a more sophisticated attack against a hardened target, whereas lower level members, relatively starved financially, uh, would be more inclined to orient, and orient their violence towards a, a softer target. Uh, furthermore, you know, in gangs, it's often said that uh, people use violence in order to rise up within the organization, in order to demonstrate their radicalism, their, their commitment to the group. Um, and I think that something similar may be happening uh, with militant groups, where low-level members, for their own personal ends, not to pressure governments into making concessions, but to demonstrate their sincerity to the group, their radicalism, etc., are incentivized to attack civilian targets, to commit these kinds of atrocities. Whereas if you're already at the organizational apex, you don't need to engage in this sort of career um, posturing. And, and an anecdotal example, if you will, uh, is Jihadi John. Jihadi John would be totally unknown 
if he wasn't so famous, or notorious, I should say, for chopping off people's heads. And in fact, my understanding is that among the foreign jihadi group of Islamic State, he has really risen to the top. He, he has all sorts of managerial positions over uh, newer fighters, and I believe that's because of the, the gruesomeness of his violence within the group. And then, finally, uh, lower-level members, I think, are more likely to, be, to, to have an emotional response, which could influence their target selection in a way that the leadership doesn't. Um, and that's because the foot soldiers are really you know, by definition, embedded in the actual operations, operational level of the conflict, whereas the leadership could be sitting pretty, very wealthy in, in Turkey or somewhere in the Gulf, etc. Um, an example is, is, is as recent as is this week, week with uh, the Nusra group, the uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate based in Syria. Uh, my understanding is that Nusra went into a Druze village and one of the Druze members killed a Nusra member, and Nusra came back very pissed off and basically uh, indiscriminately attacked uh, the population. And then the leadership subsequently said that it was going to punish these low level members, these foot soldiers, for engaging in this kind of indiscriminate violence, which is actually very counterproductive for the group as Nusra tries to sell itself as a moderate group. Um, and we could talk about that uh, later. Uh, but, but what I want to emphasize is that there are differences in the tactical preferences of the members, um, to, according to my theory. Uh, be, and, and it's not based so much on intellect, although I do think that there is variation in intellect from top to bottom of a militant group, but it's based more on the incentives, which are a function of one's position um, within the organizational hierarchy. So what I've just laid out to you is, is a theory. Um, but I, I've thought about uh, testing this theory in a recent article uh, with Phil Potter in uh, International Organization. And this theory was quite difficult to test. I mean, how do you test a principal agency theory? How do you test whether indeed it's true that militant groups with weaker leaders are the ones more likely to engage in terrorist attacks against civilians, right? So I started off by thinking about the, the organizational literature on groups. And one of the points that I came across is that the structure of the organization affects the leadership's control over the rank and file that uh, there seems to be a general consensus that the more centralized an organization, the more control the leadership has over lower level members, the more decentralized the organization, the more the leader needs to delegate um, decisions to uh, other members of the group. And so based on this insight, assuming it's true, um, I hypothesize that it would be decentralized groups which would be more inclined to engage in terrorist attacks against civilian targets. Um, I also was thinking a lot about communications, uh, because when I talk about weak leadership control, what I'm really talking about is sort of uh, uh, mainly, but not exclusively, difficulty of the principal you know, commanding lower level members to adopt tactical choices in accordance with his tactical preferences. So I thought of variables that might proxy the extent of leadership control over the rank and file. And it occurred to me that when operatives physically travel further away from the leadership, this erodes leadership control. It gives lower level members an additional measure of agency in terms of their tactical choices. And so I predicted that all else equal, international attacks would be associated uh, with civilian targeting more than attacks which are committed locally uh, closer to the leadership. I also thought to make use of all the new data on uh, decapitation strikes. The practice of removing the leaders of militant groups, usually by drone. Now, there's a big literature on this um, as to whether or not drones are strategically effective. Does taking out the leadership of groups 
expedite the demise of the organization? Does it impede their ability to, to generate violence, etc.? What I look at is not so much whether it's strategically effective to take out the leaders of militant groups, but how leadership decapitation affects the tactical choices of the militant groups, because in accordance with my theory, I would predict that, that situations in which the leader of a group has been taken out, that that group, which you could imagine, would suddenly give tactical agency to lower level members, that those groups, recently decapitated ones, if you will, would be more inclined to engage in terrorist attacks against civilian targets versus when we do not shoot at all at the leader or when our shots are shot at the leader but miss. When the leadership is intact, the quality of the militant group violence um, should be better than when the leader has been removed because then you have these low-level guys who are incentivized to attack, to attack civilian targets, which, generally speaking, is politically costly. Um, and so I predicted that operationally successful <coughs> DCAP strikes um, would promote uh, civilian targeting by militant groups. I also was thinking that it may not be a requirement that the, that the drone, for example, actually takes out the leader because you can easily imagine how when we are raining down a whole lot of drones on, milita on militant leaders, that also impedes their ability to communicate. The uh, West Point has a trove of documents uh, that were seized, uh, seized from uh, bin Laden's compound, um, which shows that although he wasn't taken out by drone, these drones really did affect his thinking and reduced his communications to lower level members because he was forced to go in hiding and to not use email and uh, restrict his use of messengers, etc. cetera. Um, I've also did all sorts of robustness tests. Um, for example, some people might say, well, sure, decapitation strikes promote civilian targeting because what you're looking at essentially is just revenge. Militant groups are really angry when you've taken out their leaders, so they blow up civilian targets. So what I did in a separate paper, a forthcoming paper in terrorism and political violence with the economist Yofen Moru, is we compared um, the tactical effects of decapitation strikes when militant leaders, when the military leaders of the organization are taken out versus when the political leadership is taken out of these groups because we would expect to find that both taking out the political leader and the military leader creates some kind of a revenge impulse, but we should really only see an uptick in civilian targeting when the quality of the military you know, control is degraded, and that's what we find. When, when a political leader of a group has been taken out, we don't see an uptick in civilian targeting. It's only when the military leader of these groups is taken out that we uh, observe that effect. Um, in, a, uh, in a separate study, uh, which I think is related, um, I find that uh, splinter groups, groups that splinter off from a parent organization, are more likely also to engage in terrorist attacks against civilians, which I believe has to do with the fact that these splinters, um, by their very definition, tend to be more immature. They tend to be newer. They tend, many of them are newer to violence, although that's not always true. Um, and, and this is what I find, that splinters, all else equal, I do a, um, a network analysis paper um, showing that these kinds of groups in particular are more likely to strike civilian targets. Now, all of this got me thinking that maybe my theory can explain another sort of long-standing puzzle within terrorism studies, which has gotten very, very little attention, either theoretically or empirically. And that is the fact that if you go into the library and you start reading terrorist books, books on terrorism, almost all of them, at least out of the social sciences, will begin with this idea that terrorism is a communication strategy. You can see it on, on, on syllabi around the world. Terrorism is a communication strategy, uh, which could mean all sorts of things, but is usually meant as a means 
to signal to the target country or to potential supporters that the group has a certain measure of organizational capability to inflict this level of pain, um, often to soften governments up into making concessions. And yet, what's interesting is that the, the vast majority of terrorist attacks are actually not claimed. The vast majority, not just terrorist attacks, but attacks by militant groups, whether it's directed against civilian targets or military targets. In fact, fewer than 15%, less than 15% of all militant group attacks are claimed by the group. Now, of course, governments are unlikely to make concessions if they don't know the identity of the perpetrators. A, a, a basic premise of coercion is that for it to work, there needs to be a dyadic recognition between the perpetrators and the target about who committed the attack. And so I started thinking to myself, you know, if it's true that the leadership tends to have a better understanding that civilian targeting is actually a political liability in comparison to attacks against military targets, then maybe variation in credit claiming is due to the target selection of the operatives. And what I find is that controlling for all sorts of things, like the ideology of the group, the capability of the group, uh, all sorts of things, that target selection indeed is the strongest variable in terms of predicting whether the leadership claims credit for the organization's attacks. Again, not to be repetitive, but just so you understand, when operatives essentially defy the tactical preferences of the leadership by attacking civilian targets, the leaders are much less likely to assume organizational responsibility than when the operatives comply with the tactical preferences or accord with the tactical preferences of the leadership by striking military targets. An interesting illustrative case for you is the uh, MH17 attack, which was when the uh, airplane above Ukraine uh, was blown up relatively recently. And uh, it's interesting because initially, the, um, the sort of like the foot soldiers, if you will, the operatives got on social media and started bragging about this operationally successful strike because they thought that it was a military plane. But then, oh, it emerged to them, this was not a military plane, this was civilian aircraft, it was a commercial aircraft, and all of a sudden the leadership, including Putin, started saying, we have nothing to do with this whatsoever, this was not us. And so even in a, a salient, you know, anecdotal case, you could see this kind of variation where the leadership oftentimes seems to have some basic recognition that civilian attacks will only hurt the organization if attributed to it. Uh, that paper is uh, still under review uh, in uh, international security. Now, what is the opposite of an unclaimed attack by a militant group? When you think about it, it might be understood as propaganda of the militant group. And so I'm doing a study now um, that's a content analysis of uh, hundreds of uh, propaganda videos uh, by militant groups, the most active militant groups in the world. Um, and what I'm looking for in particular is whether just as sort of whether we're seeing sort of the mirror opposite of unclaimed attacks. Whereas the unclaimed attacks tend to be against civilian targets, the emphasis in these propaganda videos tends to disproportionately be attacks, selective violence against military targets in comparison to the actual tactical choices of the militant groups. That is to say, I expect to find that militant groups tend to use much more indiscriminate violence against civilian targets than is represented in their propaganda videos where they're trying to show what their organization is all about. And this makes intuitive sense, for example, I mean, ISIS might be an exception, 
But if you look at you know, the Taliban, for example, it doesn't sell itself by saying, you know what, we have a whole lot of guys who like to go into markets and blow up you know, women and children. No, that, that's not a huge selling point for the group. It tends to be attacks against you know, the uh, Afghan military or, or NATO forces, etc. Now, a question that I have not, I'm wrapping up here, but a question that I have not answered is um, why do, how do you explain variation in the leadership support of civilian attacks? Because surely there are some leaders um, that do in fact favor civilian targeting. Um, and what I'm looking at now in another paper is whether militant groups exhibit signs of learning by eschewing over time civilian targets as the political costs become more apparent. Of course, rationality doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes, but I mean, to summarize a very complex literature, my understanding is that it means that there should be some learning process in the same way as most other people, such that people, uh, such that the leaders would Jesus, would update their, um, their tactical choices based on the observable outcomes. And so what I'm hoping to find, what I expect to find, is that uh, there is this sort of learning that goes on by militant group leaders where they come to appreciate over time the political costs of civilian attacks. And I could actually give a number of important, intrinsically important cases where that seems to be true. Um, Al-Qaeda, for example, uh, despite its behavior with the Druze, does at least rhetorically seem to have appreciated that, for example, the kind of violence perpetrated by Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, which was totally indiscriminate, Al-Qaeda's affiliates aren't really engaging in that sort of behavior. They seem more interested in trying to woo the local population. We see that not just in Syria, um, but also in Yemen. Um, and even bin Laden, you know, very famously was very critical of the AQI leadership by saying, look, you guys are essentially screwing things up. You, your violence needs to be more selective. It's too indiscriminate. You're hurting the Al-Qaeda brand. Um, and so there, there are many cases um, where I think it's worth testing whether it is generalizable that the leadership is learning to eschew this kind of violence. So I'll just wrap up with some policy implications. Um, based on this research, um, I can help to explain, predict even, uh, which kinds of groups are more likely to attack civilian targets, when and why. Um, you can imagine how this might be useful for all sorts of reasons, like in Israel, say, uh, in terms of uh, airport security, uh, it could help to delimit the focus in terms of the kinds of groups that are more likely to, to try to you know, attack a civilian airliner versus groups that, that wouldn't. Um, I could tell you uh, all sorts of things about drones, um, how leaders uh, or, or how militant groups respond tactically to them, um, how uh, drone attacks, whether it, it takes out the leader or doesn't, alters the tactical choices of militant groups and why. Um, you can imagine how this might be effective for, say, NGOs on the ground that want to respond to drone attacks. They should know that in the two-week period, for example, after attacks on the Taliban leadership, that that group is much more likely to attack military tar or uh, civilian targets than before. Um, outdoors, uh, um, <coughs> restaurants, uh, things like that. Um, I can tell you, uh, I, I've done one of the very first systematic studies on whether groups claim credit for their attacks, um, and I can tell you uh, when they tend to claim credit for their attacks um, and why. I could also tell you things about propaganda, how they're prop a lot of people are very interested, I'm very interested in this question, for example, of Islamic State and its propaganda. I can, and, and there's a real question of its reliability. Are the terrorists actually going to do what they say they're going to do, for example? And so I can provide some insight in terms of the alignment between the propaganda and the actual future behavior of militant groups. And finally, I can tell you why certain counterterrorism strategies, um, which are very, very popular around the world, 
um, are actually uh, not very good ones. Um, why, uh, why we shouldn't expect them uh, to work on any systematic basis. Now, you'll recall that the strategic model says that groups turn to terrorism because of its effectiveness politically in comparison to other tactical choices. And so many counterterrorism strategies, at least implicitly, are based on this idea that if we could divest terrorism of its political utility, then the perpetrators will be less likely to use this tactic. For example, many governments around the world will say things like, we will not negotiate with terrorists. We're going to have a, a no negotiation policy. And the basic idea behind it is that the perpetrators and the would-be perpetrators will see that actually these perpetrators are not achieving their political goals through terrorism um, because the government has a no concessions policy. And so presumably the group will abandon using uh, this tactic. Alternatively, the international community tends to favor a peace process. The idea is we'll sit the terrorists down with the government, they'll work out their problems in a peaceful political fashion, and there will be no use for terrorism because the perpetrators can achieve their goals instead at the bargaining table. Uh, al alternatively, uh, democracy promotion was very much in favor. And again, the idea was that we're going to empower people to achieve their political ends through peaceful political means rather than through terrorism. And so if they only have a peaceful political outlet in the form of democratic governance, then terrorism will be less valuable for them politically. Now, of course, all of these counterterrorism strategies uh, has a very bad track record. Uh, the fact that governments do not make concessions to terrorists in no way um, seems to incentivize them to abandon the practice. If you look at the, the list of, of foreign terrorist organizations, what you'll see is a list of groups that have been on there for a very long time um, that continue to use the same sort of tactics, it seems, regardless of whether there's been any visible political progress. So a no concessions policy doesn't really seem to work very well in terms of wrapping up terrorist groups. Uh, I don't have to tell you this, but peace processes have a very imperfect record at ending uh, militant group violence or terrorist violence. Um, in fact, in many cases, there are spoilers and peace processes do not reduce the violence, they actually uh, increase it, at least in the short term. And uh, I don't think many people today still believe that democracy promotion is a good way to reduce terrorism. There have been a few very salient failures, and it's one of the reasons why I'm not in favor of regime change um, pretty much anywhere uh, in terms of the forcible removal of leaders to open the country up to, uh, to all sorts of disparate members of the population. And finally, I would just argue that the reason why these kinds of counterterrorism strategies, in my opinion, have such a poor track record is because the strategic model, while an interesting intuitive model, um, isn't really empirically substantiated and accurate. I do not believe that lowering the political value of terrorism uh, reduces it because I do not believe that the political utility is what's driving the terrorism in, in the first place um, and that my organizational model um, is, uh, is better in, in all sorts of different ways. Thank you so much. Open to questions, yes. Uh, thanks, Max. That was brilliant. Really brilliant. Um, I've got three questions. One is, uh, how do you measure the political goals of terrorists? Because, you know, if I'm thinking of, I, I can't think of numbers, only specific examples, you have to forgive me. But if I take Hamas to say, okay, they want the destruction of Israel, or you could pick any number of tactical goals. And you could say, well, look, really, they've got, they know they've got no prospect of achieving that goal in any kind of negotiation. Israel will never give in on that. Their goal is to simply weaken Israel, depress morale over a long run, they hope. And Arafat, you know, the model of, of the Viet Cong, 
applied to terrorism and all that. So that's number one. How does that work? Can I just take them one at a time? So they're fresh, so, and then you'll get yeah. to question two, three. Yeah. So um, I agree with you. I mean, there's no obvious explanation about how to measure the effectiveness of groups. And one of the reasons why is because they have um, all sorts of different goals, it would seem. Uh, one way to look at it is uh, a distinction between uh, what I call process goals and outcome goals. Process goals pertain to maintaining the organization, attracting attention, gaining members, maybe, maybe weakening the, uh, the target country. Um, whereas the outcome goals of, of terrorist groups um, are their, their stated political aims. And, and all terrorist groups, by their very definition, have a stated political aim or some presumed political end goal or else they wouldn't be terrorists. They would be um, another um, kind of criminal, essentially. Um, but I agree with you, it's tricky. Uh, take like Al-Qaeda. It's a very sort of protein group that seems to have shifted even its outcome goals over time. They seem to be rather malleable. I don't disagree with that. Uh, one way to get around it is that I used uh, in independent coders to code what the, um, what, what the outcome goals were and the level of success. So that is some, that might alleviate some people. Um, another thing that I did to get around it was that in the study on hostage taking, that's much easier because the demands are much more precise. The group says, I want financial ransom. I want you to deposit money into this bank account. Or I want um, the release of prisoners, of terrorist prisoners from government custody. Or I want safe passage into another country. I use Iterate for that and that data set um, codes the, the nature of the demand as well as the outcome. But I agree with you, it's, it's tricky conceptually and yeah, in a practice. I'm going to try and roll the other two things into one to okay. save time. That is, are terrorist leaders more strategic than you give them credit for visit the organization? So talk, do they think about the organization dynamics? For example, one of the criticisms out of Arafat, or Arafat, was he deliberately let yes. people take taxes that he winked a lot, right, in the interviews with Barbuti. And that was, so he wants that kind of dynamic. So a dynamic that you see as imposed is actually chosen, and related to that is the choice of do terrorists learn? You know, most politicians, when they want to be popular, they go to the extreme to get the base, and then when they've got the base, they go to the center, right? Do terrorist groups do the same thing? Mm -hmm. So what I mean, is it, is it, are they more strategic than you give them credit? Well, I do, I don't want to say that the leadership isn't strategic. I think that they are, but the question is whether they're strategic in ways that I'm not describing. Whether, whether they might say, for example, that they oppose indiscriminate violence against civilians while secretly being quite happy that their operatives commit this kind of violence. Um, one way around that is um, the Mayrod data set codes for the sort of official position of the leadership with respect to civilian targeting. And what Phil Potter and I find is that when the leader comes out against civilian targeting and tells the group not to. Conditional on that leader being strong, in terms of it being a centralized group, the, the operatives are actually qu quite unlikely to, to deviate from that and to engage in civilian targeting. It's only when the organization is weakly, is led by a weak leader, or when, and, and of course, the most common case where there's civilian targeting is when there's a strong group, a, a group that's led very centrally by a leader who favors civilian targeting. Um, so that's one explanation. The second question is a great one. I'll have to think more about it. Um, two questions. One of them is that, so look, I mean, we take the, the most famous example of the terrorist attack, right? 9 11. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to believe that this was not ordered by the matter. Yes. And, and, and yet, so you have to, according to your thesis, he was simply stupid. I mean, you know, they, he was making a big mistake. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, short term, long term, so to say. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. My, my, the research I presented does not do a very good job of explaining cases in which the leadership seems to favor civilian targeting. Um, but, but I do think that it, I, I do have an explanation that's consistent with the rational actor model where I believe that the leadership does learn. And you've seen that. Um, in all sorts of ways with respect to Al-Qaeda. 
Um, bin Laden himself, if you go through the documents seized from his compound, um, has a real appreciation that the civilian targeting um, was counterproductive. Um, and these affiliates um, do not use violence in the same indiscriminate fashion, um, at least at the level of the leadership. They seem to have an awareness, you know. The Nusra leader said explicitly that he does not want to, that, 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 the, that the overall leader of Al-Qaeda has instructed him for his affiliate not to attack the United States because doing so will provoke the United States into attacking Al-Qaeda and this will be unproductive for the group. Um, I do understand that there are other theorists um, in terrorism studies um, who really emphasize the strategy of terrorists being uh, provocation, right? Like uh, Kidd and Walter and their uh, strategies of terrorists, um, you know, really emphasize that provocation is the goal. When you think about it conceptually, provocation is the opposite of concessions. In provocation, the target country goes on the offensive um, versus retreating um, politically. Um, I think that although terrorist groups may say that they really like provocation, if you actually look at before the provocation itself, when they, when they highlight examples of successful cases according to them, they're not examples of provocation. They, only, they tend to say that retroactively to justify the behavior. Um, for example, when bin Laden highlighted the successful cases, they weren't of provocation, they were of the opposite of concessions. And I actually think that people tend to overrate the, the, the intelligence of terrorists and the smartness of terrorists and the effectiveness of terrorists in part because almost regardless of how governments respond, people say this is exactly what the terrorists uh, wanted all along. You know, so we talk about the terrorist mastermind, the sophistication so, uh, of their. Exactly say that. Does that Yes. We don't think the same way as many people do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and let's come back to the fence. Now, um, here's my theory, which I wrote down. Okay. That, that, that these guys are we call the Palestinians are, are, are very rational indeed. Because when they committed these acts of terror using suicide, um, they could predict the consequence. They knew that there would be a fence. Something had to be done to stop this. Now, why do they want a fence? Well, they actually want the fence. They'll tell you that they want the wall, so that's propaganda in many ways. But by having the fence, they segmented the labor market, as we say in economics. And when, when there was no segmentation of the labor market, and Arabs from the uh, Palestinian areas could work in, the, in our labor market, they had high incomes, and this reduced the incomes of the elites. It's a basic economic model. That <coughs> the, the elites want low labor costs. They want someone to polish their shoes and to clean their car. They want people working in the fields for them. So the fence actually had the effect of segmenting the labor market, reducing labor costs over in the Palestinian side. And the motives are all economic and not at all political. So we economists look for the economic motive because we believe in the primacy of economics. We now believe in the, that the emotion is, is a, uh, a good uh, candidate also to moving people that's behavioral economics. So I believe up to everything that, you know, that these, these people were rational. Yeah. Suicide paid off for them. They got what they wanted in terms of economic uh, advantages. And there's some subsidiary benefit because when they talk to foreign journalists, they can call the fence a wall. I mean, I, 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 I expect there are all sorts of different ways of measuring whether something is economically beneficial from the vantage of the group. Um, in your causal story, I'm sure you can make the case that it, it, it helps maybe the leadership financially. Um, well, it helps the elites. Yeah, the elites, the elites. Even, even in the dictatorship, you have got to have some people. Support. Sure, but I can also but Actually, make, Alan, Krug, Alan Kruger and yeah, yeah. Alan Princeton. Yes. Yeah, they, did a, they did a survey, I don't know, but we have, if we economists don't believe survey evidence. As we say in English, you can say what you want. Uh, we want to see you buy the ice cream and not say, I would buy an ice cream. But he did a survey of uh, so-called Palestinian workers, mm -hmm. and he found that the workers were against the terror. 
-hmm. And they could predict, they are also rational, they could predict that if this suicide terror continued, they'd have to say, they'd be stuck over on their side, as not many of them are. I could point so you to Shikaki polls. Sorry? I could point you to Shikaki polls showing the opposite, that there's very high level of support among the Palestinians, and that in their view, they think that the tactic is optimal. In service. But what is Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's inherent to the methodology, but it's evidence. Um, in, in any event, I appreciate your point. Um, yes, yes. And not, not only that, just because they're economists doesn't necessarily mean they have an economic explanation. Many of the very best terrorism scholars are economists. They use their background in economics using, um, you know, various methods. Um, to advance all sorts of alternative explanations that don't, where the answer isn't necessarily an uh, economic explanation you itself. Uh, there are quite a few. Yes, uh, yes, I have a question. <laughs> Just tell me if I understood you correctly. You say that the more decentralized the group, the yes. more we should expect attacks on civilians. Yes. Now, I can give you a lot of examples where you have centralized groups that initially attacks attack civilians. Yes. Groups from Hezbollah in Berges to all the, the, the plane hijacking, and, and the list is, is, is endless. Yeah, I mean, again, there are really cases for everything, um, and so that's why I look at, uh, you know, the biggest samples I can get. Um, but I agree with you. There are, it's not, you know, 100% variation. Um, it's that, generally speaking, all else equal, decentralized groups are significantly more likely to prey on civilian targets than more centralized groups. Yeah. But I agree with you, there are exceptions, no doubt. Yes? And in your criticism of uh, rationality, you said in your research from 2007 that individuals tend to make, take care of themselves and not all, all the uh, benefit of the whole group. The, two, the, the what terrorists really want? Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is, you say that violence uh, tends to, to rise in this situation, but my, my question is, yeah. if local leaders of groups such as ISIS that say that uh, they've gotten a hand on an oil field, such a local leader can be, uh, can negotiate with an affluent government, and then the government can influence him to uh, stop uh, his attacks in favor of money, merchandise, and goods, because he's, uh, he has his own tactic, and he, uh, he takes care of himself, and he uh, takes care of his own benefit, and not the group. So the violence can be decreased, <coughs> not rise in this situation. Mm -hmm. This is my question. Or, uh, I really, I try to be sort of contrary, and I think that a lot of um, political scientists, and frankly a lot of economists, they may not actually know that much about terrorism. Um, and they come in and try to use kind of theories off the shelf. Um, and that's really what happened among political scientists, where the strategic model became, you know, basically ubiquitous, even though none of the pioneers or advocates of the strategic model had published anything on the subject of terrorism before. Whereas in my case, I started studying terrorism before I became a political scientist. Um, and so a lot of these theories didn't ring true to me. In that, in that 2008 piece, it's called What Terrorists Really Want, what I essentially argue is that an alternative incentive structure to the conventional wisdom better explains why people um, participate in terrorist groups. Then rather than the strategic model, um, it seems to be uh, the social solidarity of participating in terrorist groups uh, that motivates most members and that furthermore can explain the strategic choices of the groups. Um, so that's just, it's similar to what I presented. It's called What Terrorists Really Want? Um, and it's another sort of uh, attack um, on the strategic model but with a different 
uh, explanation. So is there can be a, a renegade a local general that uh, splinters of the group that does whatever he wants in the... In yeah, the you, yeah, you very often see that. Um, that's captured uh, in my case studies. Um, I do a lot of very detailed case studies um, where I show that low-level members, when they have more autonomy, um, they tend to uh, attack civilian targets for all sorts of uh, personal ends. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, thinking about uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, yeah. I think that this gentleman has a point. Okay. Since uh, simply uh, economic reason, which is behind, of course, religious and, and uh, extreme Islam, but economics. Yeah. And, that, and, and, yeah. The, and, and uh, the, the, uh, having nothing in that area. I mean, sure. the economic project. This is the cause of this perpetrators. Sure. So but, I, I, but, yeah, yeah. but this is just a side to it. You touched only the margin of the problem. I think that terror in general mm. in our days is a much more significant issue that we are thinking or considering it. Because terror touched in year 2014 more than 80 countries. Uh, nine thousand eight, more than 9,800 uh, accidents yeah. were happening around the world in 80 countries, and more than 18,000 people were killed, yeah. and tens of thousands were injured. And until today, we as academia do not give enough uh, emphasis and do not uh, uh, conduct enough research on this issue because it's, this is going becoming the biggest political uh, uh, factor in, in coming years. Yeah, I'm um, just interested. Just, I mean, I think that there are many different economic explanations. I actually think that although you, you both advance economic explanations, yours is a little bit different. He mentioned Kruger, the Kruger study. Kruger actually finds that poverty does not predict terrorism. Um, right? That, that, that's one of Kruger's main findings. Whereas what you're saying is that in Nigeria, Boko Haram attacks are concentrated in the north, which is more impoverished. So that, that's actually opposite to the more general trend. That doesn't mean it's not true. I, I think that there are certain conflicts that probably are driven by poverty, even if poverty isn't a good causal explanation globally. Um, I would say, though, with respect to Boko Haram, that that actually fits my theory um, as well. Um, you know, the leader um, before Shekau uh, was uh, Youssef. And Youssef was killed uh, in government custody uh, around 2010. And it was actually only after he was killed that the group became, became so darn crazy in terms of uh, blowing up civilians. And that's an example of how the replacement to the leadership can actually make the group even more extreme. Or job. Just as ISIS is based in Sunni communities. Yeah, ISIS is in, in Ambar for a reason. Yeah. Uh, the host. They operate also in the south. I just want to continue on the SMS. Yes. Um, they need transportation. To, to what extent would you say that terrorism is piracy? You mentioned terrorism is terrorism because they had political votes. Yes. Yeah, it, would be crime, it would be crime, simply crime. Right. But we see that a lot, of, especially in Africa, that the terrorist groups are alive with pirates. And in fact, you could, you could see, view pirate, terrorism simply as another form of piracy. It's a way of getting money through taking over oil fields and so forth. And, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, even, even when you look at Hamas, which doesn't take over oil, oil fields, but maybe their, their external donors are more generous to them when they do extreme things. So this is, they, in other words, they don't want, actually want to win. They want to struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think it gets back to the process goals versus outcome goals. I mean, 
for all organizations, they need certain things, regardless of whether they're terrorist groups or not. They need people, they need some money, you know? And so it's not either or. It's not that terrorist groups are not interested in financial things. In fact, that's a requirement for the group. But if they were only interested in that, and there was no presumed political motive, they probably would not be labeled as terrorists. They should not call yeah. them terrorists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, John. If you want to broaden the discussion on the economic motive uh, a little bit outside of the terror, you have sort of the Collier and Hoffler argument, I'm sure you know it. Yeah, uh, Greed. They, they, they basically made the argument, this was in 1993, 1994, something like that, they published a very big article where they said conflict in Africa is driven by greed. The country with the most natural resources had the most conflict, but not terrorism in particular, and the, and the conflict was basically driven in finance by the, t by the combatants exploiting and fighting over the natural resources. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that's not a factor, mm -hmm. although their theory, A, their story doesn't connect with their evidence as well as people think it does. Mm -hmm. This is on record, so be very careful. Okay. It, a lot. I'm not the first one. <coughs> I'm to joking. I know. I'm not, I'm not the first one to make this argument. I don't think they're going to get upset at me for repeating arguments people have been saying for yeah, yeah, yeah. and a half. And if they are, they're really so shocked. Especially if they're true. And, and, and if they are, they're just really, really touched. I don't know <laughs> personally. So, uh, so you, you have that. And the, the other issue is people have had a lot of difficulty replicating the study outside of Africa, whatever evidence they did find. Yeah. So it, it tends to work better for very weak states in the first place. This explanation doesn't work well for said explain say terrorism in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and relatedly I, I, I assign the, the fear on Leighton, which it, which touches on very similar issues, greed versus grievance. Well, they, and what they find they is Yeah, 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 for sure. For, and they should. Who um, were they? Fear on and Leighton. Leighton? David Leighton. Stanford James. James. Yeah. Jim Fear and James Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the Thanks for coming. Uh, my question is about credibility. You spoke of, you spoke about the effectiveness or the, or the cost effectiveness according to the economist, uh, economic uh, experts here. Uh, and uh, I'm, 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 let's let's say if, if we take a small creature in the international relation. Uh, small space like United States or in small small organization like ISIS, sure. uh, we will uh, check their uh, current conflict in a specific round because there are many. Uh, would you be able to predict the amount of credibility on the eyes of a specific uh, target audience? Well, I read I read I read, I read your article about credibility. So I, I think credibility is only a relevant question when the when one of the parties, the challenger, if you will, rather than the defender, when the challenger makes some sort of a seemingly reasonable proposal. The question then becomes, will the challenger adhere to his seemingly moderate stance? If the challenger has expresses very extreme preferences, like we're gonna freaking kill all you guys and take your women, you know, then the issue of of credibility as far as negotiation doesn't really, isn't that relevant because when groups express what I call maximalist goals, they don't tend to induce concessions or trade regardless of their tactical choices. So I wouldn't try to scrutinize the credibility of terrorism by looking at a group like ISIS because the, goal, the goals are so maximalist. I, Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think we're dealing with a different causal well, mechanism. I, 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 I think all of us will, will uh, agree that, that, that they're very credible. If you can compare it to others, you're going to say that. If they say they want to credible, they're yeah. trying to do it. But, but, People so, don't dispute them. That's something you can take for granted. You have many organizations that they will say, uh, you know, we will yeah. kill you all, we will uh, cut your heads off uh, yeah. easily. If they have and, they have, and they haven't and still achieved no, the goal. No, if they have a chance, of course, do that. Precisely that. I think it's a strategy. My so, so, I'm a nice person. The same as strategy. 
submitted my paper to international security, the title of it was actually Why Terrorist Groups Make Poor Coercers, right? Because, and that really highlighted what I was trying to show. It was more accurate. Terrorism is bad at coercing government concessions, but they thought that it would be, that it would be sexier to call it Why Terrorism Does Not Work. And ever since then, Every time I give a talk, people say to me, how can you say categorically terrorism does not work? For example, if your dependent variable isn't government concessions, but death itself, then terrorism seems to be very effective. I will readily concede that point. It's true. Terrorism only doesn't work when you define it the way that I do. But the reason why I find it the way I do is because that's how most political scientists define it. But I mean, why do you do that? That's another question. Why do you do that? I thought this up. Apart from assuming rationality, I'm and oh, that that's human nature goes beyond. Sure, but that, that that's really it. That people have different goals, um, and that they pursue them in in sensible ways based on the information that they have available. That's all I assume. Fundamentally nice. I would. I, I, I like. You know, I, I like the Steven Pinker thesis. Better Angels, are you familiar with that? Steven Pinker has written a book, uh, better, The Better Angels of Ourselves, um, something like that. And what he, he, he's a, 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 a scientist, right? And what he says is that this sort of binary distinction between being like good and bad doesn't really apply that both the good and the bad are positive traits in a sense in terms of promoting our fitness as a species and that essentially we tap into the good or the bad based on whether we think that it, it will serve us. I recently watched the new Jurassic Park movie and in it they have these beasts 
that some of them are very, very good and some of them are very, very bad. And I think that's the way I look at human nature. <laughs> yes. Um, you made a very interesting distinction between the sure. innovation and the strategic model yeah. and between the uh, weak and the, uh, maybe stronger leadership. I was thinking a lot about the matter of age. You spoke about mm. control. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, at least in China, made it, OK? I don't believe many early leaders say that we quell the intifada, I don't think we quell the intifada, but we saw that the age of suicide bombers dropped yeah. by using children. Yes. Okay? And you can see it also now with ISIS. Yes. Okay, and this is a new thing. It's at the yes. beginning they used uh, uh, mature uh, uh, people. Yes. And I was wondering if you know anything or if you did it yourself on this notion of that the dropping age of the suicide bombers uh, have any indication reverse of success or does it mean dwindling down or something like sure. that? Sometimes they even say that they take these children that maybe don't understand much, right? And, and maybe don't have fear, right. you know? And they actually have the grown up yes. supervising that they won't escape from yes. the attack, right? Yeah, what you're, what you're describing is not specific to the, to the Palestinians. Um, it seems to be uh, international. Uh, a, a very prominent example these days, the Cubs of the Caliphate, the Caliphate Cubs. Have you seen them? Um, and you're quite right, in Nigeria, uh, Boko Haram is using not just uh, young kids, but girls more and more. Um, and very frequently, um, oh, well, the I mean, girls, yeah, the yeah, the yeah, they want to sell them because they're mm -hmm. as you said. Yeah, they use the merchandise. They use them in every possible way. They use them. They they rape them. They have kids with them. They use them as suicide so bombers. They, they sell them. They didn't rape the girl. Yes, they, they did. They're they coming back pregnant. Most all of them. Catch some merchandise yeah. and to sell them to sheikhs in Niger and so on because no other merchandise in the area. Almost, the question, almost all of these girls who come back from Boko Haram have been impregnated. But the question I'm is, sure. yes. But the question is, are, are they manipulating certain crowds, or does it mean actually that the, the diminishing uh, resource uh, of active, uh, uh, let's say, mature fighters? So the, uh, can, can, can we say as a country that when we see this kind of trend, yeah. it means... You know what I think it means? I think it means, well, first of all, that there are no moral inhibitions on the group. They're certainly willing to do anything. Um, but I think that it also, and this is speculative, I think that it may indicate a manpower problem. I think that if they had their druthers, if they had complete choices, they had an infinite pool of, of um, members that I would think they wouldn't use young kids who are basically too young to decide on their own and who haven't achieved much in life. I think in a way it may be a sign of desperation. Um, but in other cases it could signal different things. I mean, I think that Boko Haram has become more desperate over time. And during that time, it's turned to younger kids. Right? Because they, they've suffered a real manpower crunch. In the case of ISIS, I think the use of kids is slightly different because I know that it, Boko Haram is the Islamic State of West Africa, so in a sense they're, they're both Boko Haram, one's an affiliate. But um, Boko Haram proper, the parent group, seems more interested in long term planning. And that require, that, that's why its propaganda is so oriented towards attracting women so they can have children, and they're attra attracting these cubs of the caliphate to basically build up a long-term caliphate that has women and men and children. So I think the appeal to different demographic groups may work differently for a group like Islamic State. Yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah, I think uh, one uh, thing was missing, uh, it depends on the nation, because in what happens over time. Yes. And especially in your experiment, that people were angry just after the sun turned up. But over time, as time passes, the anger diminishes. Yes. So the, maybe the strategic logic would be, I will make terror acts now, and I will take responsibility now against civilians. And over time, yes. the other side, the other leadership will see that I'm going to be more moderate, and there is no place who they can communicate with. 
So I, 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 I'm not no idea about evidence, just like uh, I agree with you. Um, and in, in, in to sort of account for the temporal dimension, um, I try to give the groups a long time to achieve their goals, right? Like sometimes like uh, many decades. So I do. Um, in terms of the causal mechanism for why terrorism even committed a long time ago would impede groups from achieving their demands, there's, this is just my impression that when a group uses an extreme tactic like terrorism, pe people especially, maybe not in the international community, but people from the target country tend to conceive of that group in terms of the most extreme tactic that it used against that specific population. Um, so for example, when we talk about terrorist groups, it's a little bit misleading because it may imply to some people that this group is reliant on terrorism. But actually, almost all aggrieved groups use a hybrid of different tactics. They attack civilian targets, military targets, they engage in nonviolent protests, um, etc. So, But we call them terrorist groups because for us, the most salient feature of them is that they use this extreme tactic. And I think that there's a real stickiness in practice where when a group uses a really extreme tactic, we're very slow to forgive. You know, uh, look at Cuba, you know? Cuba only now is coming off the state-sponsored list. Like, not in my lifetime have they been using terrorism, but like, once a group uses terrorism, the target country doesn't tend to forgive and tends to, associate, tends to believe not just that they use extreme tactics, but that they're untrustworthy because they secretly harbor these extreme political ambitions as well. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Max. Thank you so much. This was Out of the hot seat. <laughs> this was a very interesting talk and discussion, and I hope that it will lead to more cooperation between the economics department and the political science department, and that uh, uh, this will be the first in a series of lectures that we hopefully will continue next year. I just want to also say uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I know the school year is winding to an end. I appreciate your time and listening to me and uh, asking tough questions.